Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're very pleased to have as our guest on our program Mr. E. R. Shannon, who is an old-timer in this uh, general area of the province and uh, who is going to tell us something about the early life in this particular district. Uh, we might say that we're very uh, happy to congratulate Mr. Shannon on the fact that he is just celebrating his 85th birthday. Now, Mr. Shannon, when did you first come to this part of British Columbia? Well, I turned in 1894. 1894. And where did you come from? I come from the States. And uh, what prompted you to come up to Canada? Well, there was a hard time over there, panic, the army, and I come on and an old truck and it hit for British Columbia in the woods. I always get a job and always be good times up in there. And that's how we come. You thought there was possibility of more prosperity up here for yourself? And well, it, there was a uh, Rostron boom was on then, and we figured we could prospect and make a million dollars you know, on the side and have the fun of doing it. Well, there was that, that Rostron gold boom that really uh, reached your ears, and you thought you'd come up and try your luck. Yes, that was it. Uh huh. Well, uh, in your prospecting, did you have any luck? Oh, I've taken a few claims, but I never run any money out of them. Mm -hmm. It was too low grade. What, what uh, part of the country was uh, was this you were doing your prospecting? Grand Fork, the, the North Fork, Grand Fork, uh, North Fork River. Mm -hmm. Well, I understand that you were doing something else, too, uh, apart from prospecting. Oh, yes. Worked in mines, trapped in the winter. Mm -hmm. But I was three years in, Kim in Phoenix. Worked for Rock Candy and the Hummingbird, OK Mine, at E Hold. All times were pretty good then. We always make a living easy enough. Mm -hmm. I understand you're driving cattle too. Oh, yes. We started driving cattle for Carrier and Mantley in 94 over to Austin. Quite a boom on there, you know, shack town, they call it. Drive cattle over and butcher them and head back. Next week, come over with another bunch, and the winter is different. They couldn't call the dude any trail. We have to go on the high water trail on by Columbia River, camp out three nights, stay with the Indians, you know, on the reservation. Is that right? Get lousy every trip. <laughs> You mentioned this Dudney Trail. It was actually in full swing at that time. Uh, the Kootenai Trail? The Dudney. Dudney, oh, it was a wonderful trail. The bottom of the building was four feet wide, weighted, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, the traffic was on, kept it pretty good shape. There was some place that was steep, and there was a few switchbacks, but it was mostly up and down. Well, now, um, you were telling me something just before we came on the air about... Uh, a big cyclone that went through. Oh, we had the cyclone there on about the 3rd of June in 84. It filled over on the roads and trailed up with timber. Mm -hmm. And it took them about three months to get the old in the trail open. It was all heavy timber then. You know, there had been no fires in there then. And what year again was that? That was 94 and 5. 94 was the hurricane, we call it. Mm -hmm. Well, you were making these trips back and forth into Rostam. Uh, you were supplying a meat store, a meat dealer in Rostam, yes. yes. And we were going over every week sometimes, every two weeks. And the winter, well, we'd take a big drive and it'd last longer, you know. Mm -hmm. Keep the meat, it's free. It. And uh, what was Rostam like, as you recall it in those days? Well, it was just a slab town. I don't know. It wasn't much of a place. There was lots of people there, and there was lots of saloons, and there was lots of drinking going on. All the miners there, you know, to get paid, they go for the wild on that square of whiskey they had there then. Is that right? And uh, wasn't there a place, uh, a street called Sourdough Alley? Sourdough Alley, that was 
the main part of the town then. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know where it is now. It's up on the hill somewhere from where the town is now, though I know that much. It looks entirely different to you now. Oh, yes, you don't know it at all. Well, now, I guess at that time there were a tremendous number of mines in operation in that area, weren't there? Yes, there were a lot of mines, and they were all hand stealing, all hammer work, you know. Mm-hmm, all worked by hand. Yes, and hard rock. And, uh, of course, the, uh, I guess there were lots of wagon trains going out with the ore, too, weren't there? Oh, boy, yes, uh, there were wagon trains over it. Sometimes over a hundred yards, four came a big wagon there, hauling at the North Port. Excuse <coughs> me. Drive up the road down, you'd meet dozens of wagons hauling this ore. It was a beautiful ore, too, you know. Mm-hmm. And they're all mine, where you go. Well, now I wonder, can you recall any of the people who were living in Rossland at that time, or stores, or? Well, there was a young fellow named Cedar Green. I think it was Charlie Cedar Green. He had a store there. I happened to know him from below. And uh, he had business so good they couldn't keep stock in. What uh, kind of store was he running? Grocery store, or store. little clothing, socks, you know, and overalls. Mm-hmm. Shoes, rubbers. Is there anyone else you can recall? No, I can't remember anymore. I, ever, I well, can't remember the names, you know. That's a long time ago. Oh, yeah, a long time ago. Well, uh, did you ever take the opportunity to come down the trail? Well, I rode down here once, but there was nothing here then, you know. Mm-hmm. Went back up. We'd get home as soon as we could. We had work to do over on the, the big farm that I had there. Carrier. Well, I understand that uh, it was a little later, though, when there was something here in the trail area that you did come down again. Oh, I come over on a special one to the ball team. I think that was about 1912, might have been 14. The time when they paid us right across the bridge there, then, where you're, well, it's a city now, you know, where they used to have a ball down, and it's across the bridge, it's on a flat there. Nice place, dusty though, you know, oh, you're dusty. <laughs> and, uh, of course, you had the opportunity then, I guess, to see the smelter in action, didn't yes, you? Yes, I was through the smelter, I watched them tap, and watched the lead running down there, a little stream over it, you know. It mm-hmm. didn't look like lead, though. It looked like shiny water or something. Sure. Well, now, when you first arrived in Grand Forks, then I guess the same situation there. I guess there wasn't very much going on at that time, was there? No, they were building the first store, manly store, a log, a log store. And Al Manley was building a hotel there, and he did get the saloon part running. Old timers would come in there from Greenwood. They'd sell a claim, maybe a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars. And between there and Carson, another little store, little saloon on past there, about four miles. They, they'd spend the whole bunch. I'd go back and make another sale, or dig up another claim or something. I just kept that up all winter and tell us it. Mm-hmm. Boy. Well, then I hauled freight. I was working for uh, old East Frank at that time, you know. We'd, I and Miller Paul, John and I, we would haul freight up for Marcus before the railroad would come in. And I had a, quite a trip once there, a load of whiskey for, for John and Dan McLaren. I broke a wagon wheel on the reservation at night. And I had to leave the whiskey sitting there all night the engine reservation, you know. I got out and swamped the road till they get around it. Went up to a half beat place to camp. I don't know where I'd get a wagon. He said he had a wagon just like it up on the hill. We went up and got it that night. And the next morning, long before did, I had to down and put the wheel on. No way touch the whiskey at all. I wrapped up the candle for it, you know. And I was sure happy. I guess you were kind of worried, though, for a while. Yes. 
Well, they were all liquor carson then, you know. Made board some from Al Manley, but the crowd would drink it up. And I met across the uh, third and Cradle River down there, drawed up there, and I would jump up in the rig. Says, this is uh, Tom McCarran Whiskey, yeah? <coughs> Well, he said, John told me to open the case and take a bottle out. Well, I said, this ain't Manly's, or it ain't McLaren liquor till I get there. This is my first. Now, you get down off of here. And I took the axe, and he got down. <laughs> now, of course, it was all a bond of goods, you know. We had to go to the cuts ball first and cut all the cords. Oh, and well, on. I guess they did. The, the times in those days were a lot more exciting, a lot wilder than they are today. Oh, boy, yes. Well, then uh, the freight came to town from Republic down to Grand Forks, hauled the war out and hauled a load of freight in, you know. It, it made a good time for Grand Forks to lift a lot of money there. Ranchers sell hay and feed, you know. But when the railroad come, well, that team told it disappeared. I understand, Mr. Shannon, that you uh, had an experience or so driving a stagecoach. Could you tell us about that? Well, it wasn't much of a coach, it just a big hack, you know. Changed horses three times. But one night I was woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning and told her I'd have to take the stage out. I said, why? Well, a big shipment of gold going out. And they don't want that other driver to go and you have to go. Well, this fella come down, he had about 30 pounds of gold, I guess. We drove down there, it was, it was in the fall, it's been muddy and it's frozen. and talk about a rough road, oh boy. They couldn't ride fast, it'd shake you out of the heck, you know. But we made it to uh, across the road from Marcus and we got in a rowboat and went across. And this fellow was a scary girl. When they held up, he had a, a sip sewer in his hand all the way across, had a newspaper work, you know. The old Pie Tooth Smith was on. He said, There's no danger. Nobody else. You got this gold. You're just as safe as you are in heaven now. Oh, I can't trust these Indians, you know. You got the reservation, or they'll hold you up in a minute. While we got across, I carried the gold up and put in the coat for the train to come in then. He gave me $10. And just thank you a lot for being too good to me. Keeping the head down in the way, you know. Uh -huh. I, were, were there many hold-ups in those days? No. Not really. No, but I'll tell you, you, you couldn't tell. You know, they would be hold-ups there. They'd, a couple of guys come in there working on the hotel, and they got drunk, a couple of kids, you know. And uh, they stole a horse, they're six sure. It's, uh, well, the first day was a Chinaman going across the line. That's old Carson. <coughs> Some old timer said, gee, well, that Chinese had a money man go there and hold him up for it. These kids done that, you know. He had $15. So they had him arrested and they had the Chinaman. Uh, William McMahon was the magistrate then, you know, they had him arrested. And that Chinaman, if he could identify his money, he spread out his money and this my money. Oh, he, no mark on it. Oh, he couldn't see anything, so they put him with some more guinea down at the same time. They said, how do you know that's your money? They took a piece of paper out of it and opened it up and there was three little corners. He tore off the five dollar bill, you know. That's how he did it. He saved his money. Uh-huh, isn't that? Well, has got six years, he took well, now, Mr. Shannon, uh, where are you living at the present time? At Wendell. That's about six miles this side of uh, Creston. And you and your wife are living there at the yeah, present time? Yes, we're living there. Mm -hmm. and I, you... I bought an acre there with a house on it, and a good garden, a spot, a little fruit, and we're just happy there. It's a nice, quiet place to live. Well, that's very, very nice. And Mr. Shannon, we'd like to thank you very, very much indeed for spending a little time with us and sharing your memories of the early days in this district. Again, thanks to Mr. E.R. Shannon.